Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church. It's Sunday morning again, January the 31st, 2021. Welcome to all of you who are tuning in for our church congregation. Man, it's going to be nice when we get to see each other face to face and can meet back in our building. But for now, I'm glad that you've joined me this morning. And uh, for those that are outside of our church body, uh, welcome. And we're glad to have you with us today. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer before I start this morning's message? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, I just pray that you would help each person that's out there, God, to um, just understand how much you love them and how much you're there with them. And God, as we talk about spiritual warfare this morning, I pray that your protection would be upon each person that's listening to this broadcast. And we thank you for your word in First Peter, Lord. And uh, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I had intended to preach uh, through to the end of First Peter chapter 5. However, I, I stopped short at verse 7. Today I'd like to speak to you on the last verses of this chapter and, and conclude my series in the book of First Peter. Now in context uh, with this first uh, part of this chapter, um, Peter was speaking to the believers about maintaining proper order in the church by encouraging people to actively display proper attitudes towards God and to one another as well, from the leadership down. Um, the elder is encouraged to take their responsibility of leadership in the church seriously, and Peter calls them to lead God's flock by example as under-shepherds of the chief shepherd. Uh, Peter also encourages the younger believers to embrace a humble, teachable attitude in willing submission to the leadership of the elders. And Peter expresses that the whole flock of God is, uh, is needing to be wary of human pride taking root in them uh, because of its destructive consequences. So when stressors come out to test us, we're tempted to let anxiety uh, take root. And Peter cast, or encourages the believers to cast all their anxieties upon the Lord in prayer, knowing that he hears us and that as our good shepherd he cares for us, um, knowing what's absolutely best. So this is vital for the proper uh, functioning of the Church of Christ so that we can fulfill our mandated mission. Now that Peter has established his point for social order in the church from a human perspective, he throws another consideration into the mix. Uh, we're not just sojourning through life in neutral territory, dealing with our own human propensity to sin because of our sin nature. There's another factor. And uh, we have an enemy out there who desires to run interference and to keep us from living righteously. In his parting words to the church, uh, first in First Peter here, this letter, uh, Peter, um, he wants to take some time to speak to the believers about the, the issue of their spiritual enemy. So he writes, starting in verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So, in consideration of what Peter just said, it's good for us, for us to know that our enemy, the devil, he has no love for humanity. He is a devourer. Um, now, while there's some disobedient spirits who have been cast into hell, the Bible talks about it, uh, kept in chains uh, awaiting judgment. Satan and many of his demons are not in hell, as some people would imagine, but they're actually about the earth, seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. In Ephesians chapter 6, 11, and 12, it's very clear that we have a, an active adversary. The Apostle Paul exhorts believers, saying, Put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly realms. Now, the devil, he's not fond of God's children, and he's always seeking to test us, to sift us, to see if he can make us fall and shipwreck our closeness with God to render us unproductive in our Christian walk. Evil always promises diamonds, but always leaves you with a lump of coal. And we're called to be alert and sober of mind. See, aware of his tricks. We're being, uh, for if we're sober in mind and alert, we're going to see his traps before we step into them. So it's easy for the human mind, you see, it's easy for us to become dull and lower our defenses. Some people start out on the road to Christ on the right pathway, but they're shipwrecked in their faith along the way. They were starting traveling in the right direction, but something happened and uh, the enemy interfered and uh, they crashed and they burned and they sunk. This is a sobering reality. Several examples of this are given in the New Testament. Um, one given by the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, he states in 1 Timothy 1, 19-20, Holding on to the faith and good conscience, which some have rejected, and so have shuffered, uh, or suffered shipwreck regarding their faith. Among them are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So who are these men, uh, Hymenus and Alexander? Men in the early church. They, they were part of the church in Ephesus. And the scriptures tell us that they suffered shipwreck with regards to their faith. And were so handed over to Satan by the Apostle Paul. Um, now Satan in his natural state looks at people and he hates them because they're made in the image of God. And Satan desires to sift and to destroy people. But he always needs permission from God to do it. Hymenus and Alexander are, you know, they rejected true doctrine and they followed false, false teaching. Hymenus and Alexander um, did not lose their salvation uh, for what uh, they were, you see, was exposed. Uh, I believe people that pretend to have faith in Christ and they follow along and they look like Christians, some of them are not. Well, it was either that or they were true believers who need to be sternly disciplined by a loving God to turn them back to the right path. Now, there is times when God allows Satan access to sift believers as disciplinary measures to give them opportunity to turn back from the wrong path they are on back onto God's righteous path or else, or else he allows them to be sifted um, to serve a greater purpose in his eternal kingdom such as martyrs in the faith have died for the sake of Christ and uh, Satan can be at the brunt of that as well and God allows it. Well, Why does God allow Satan to test us? Um, you know, we know that this hateful predator, our enemy and, and his demons, they, they want us to stumble and to fall. Why does God allow us to test us? Why does God allow them to test us, I should say? You see, although we're weak in our sin nature, um, God's not left us alone to deal with the enemy. When the enemy attacks us, it's naturally going to create some anxiety in us. And and. And it's going to cause us to be shaken to the very core. So, you know, our reliance upon ourselves is going to be shaken. And that's not a, necessarily a bad thing. You know, when we have to cast ourselves at the mercy of Christ, um, that's actually something that can be uh, causing spiritual growth in us. And uh, last week we looked at God's word through Peter, which encourages us that if we humble ourselves before the Lord and we give, us, give our anxiety to Him, He will lift us in due time because He cares for us. He'll lift us up. 
After uh, you see the, the devil and his angels, um, when they attack us, uh, God instructs us to humble ourselves before our Creator. Um, therefore, we will stand up to the devil clothed in the full armor of God when we humble ourselves before our Creator. God's provided us with spiritual armor. He hasn't left us alone. And, and God is trying to build something greater in us than what was prior to allowing Satan to sift us. Look at the life of Job. From the time that Job started uh, being sifted and tested by Satan to the end, he learned some very valuable lessons and he was better off in the end than at the start, although the journey was most unpleasant. God looks at things, I'm convinced, through um, an eternal lens where we look at things temporal. Uh, we look at things um, with what we see in front of us. But God sees beyond um, the temporal and he knows what's eternally best. See, God has chosen us to participate with him in spiritual um, warfare. You know, he could wave his hand and... Uh, you know, cause the enemy to be flattened right now, but he wants us to participate with him in resisting evil, in fighting evil. Um, you know, it's interesting, I think, how God uses us as his family and, and how he wants us to participate with him in everything. You know, he wants us to participate with him in seeing people come to Christ and experiencing salvation. He longs for us to be involved in this process. That's why he called us to preach the gospel and to, and to uh, reach out, is he wants to move with us and through us to accomplish his purposes. Well, it's the same in regards to spiritual warfare. God could just flatten the enemy, but he wants us to participate with him in spiritual warfare. You see, the Lord has um, permitted the devil and his evil companions to be a catalyst of choice. The devil's kingdom becomes an alternative to the kingdom of God. The antithesis, you might say, of the kingdom of God. Um, before a person can love, they have to have a choice to choose to love someone or not to love someone, to follow or not to follow. And in the case of God... Um, if there was no choice and we were just forced to follow God, love would not be possible. We'd be a bunch of robots. So God allows a catalyst as a choice. And the devil and his dark um, forces are the alternative to God. So when we love God, we must you know, look at God and say, Lord, you are worthy and you are desirable, and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And I want to be your child. I want to be close to you. And no, I don't want the alternative. The alternative is, is something I push away from. See, that, that enables love to, uh, to happen. Well, people have choices. Now, there's arguments out there that says that nobody has a choice, but... I don't believe that's scriptural. Even angels have a choice. Angels are given responsibilities to fight against the enemy just like we are. Um, in God's wisdom, he gives us, as his servants, the responsibility to take a stand against the enemy. Now, the power to overcome the enemy does not come from the servant. It comes from the master who empowers. But remember Daniel, who was praying to the Lord because he wanted to be close to God and he was interceding on behalf of his people. In Daniel chapter 10, he's given this vision of a gleaming angel who approaches him. And this angel communicates with Daniel, giving us a glimpse of what sometimes God permits to occur in the spiritual realm. So we read from verses 12 to 14 of Daniel 10. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now I was detained there with, uh, because I was detained there 
with the king of Persia. So I've come to explain to you what will happen in, uh, to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time, not, uh, time yet to come. So, you know, here we have an angelic battle. Um, there is this prince of Persia, which is a demonic entity that's of high rank, that's over the, the nation of Persia. And we have this gleaming angel that appears to Daniel, who is trying to get uh, through to Daniel to talk to him. But there was this spiritual war that occurred for 21 days. And this gleaming angel that appeared to Daniel needed help. So Michael, another angel, came and helped him to break through. So we have this picture of spiritual war going on in heaven. Now God could settle again. He could settle the struggle with a wave of his hand. But he's purposed to allow the devil and his demonic agents to be a catalyst. A choice to choose um, versus choosing to serve the living God. Because the devil is permitted to be the catalyst, he roams about on the earth, roaring like a hungry lion, seeking people to devour. As believers being invited into this battle, we're told that the devil will indeed come against us. That's a promise. God will permit it to happen as well. But God wants us to rely on him for strength. And he wants us to, uh, to take uh, a stand with the strength that he's given us as well um, through his grace. And he desires that we, we, we uh, put everything on the line and we, and we resist the enemy. And, and, and Ephesians 6 tells us that God has given us spiritual armor, including a helmet of salvation, which protects our mind from the sharp arrows of the devil or the evil one. Um, a breastplate of righteousness protects our heart. Belt of truth keeps everything together. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace so that we can walk and uh, our feet as we're going and traveling in the direction that God wants us to go. Our, our, our path is protected. The shield of faith, which uh, we hold out and we quench the fiery arrows of the evil one. And uh, then we've got this sword of the spirit which is our offensive weapon, the Word of God. Interestingly enough, when you look at the spiritual armor of the saints that are, that's described in Ephesians, all the armor is kind of patterned after the Roman army's garb. But you'll notice that it's all front-facing. It's meant to shield our body from a hack on the front. Um, it's God's will, you see, that we face our enemy and we fight and we advance against him. We're not just on the defensive, defending our positions. We are to advance. These spiritual weapons are not like the weapons people use in this world to take over the world physically, right? I mean, we've got this, there's some theology out there, the, new, the Kingdom Now theology, the old latter rain movement, and the new apostolic reformation movement get things wrong. Um, the world is not going to be liberated physically, until Jesus Christ comes back and literally sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives. There's, no gonna, there's not going to be a true liberation of the planet until that occurs. Any attempts to change the world outcomes physically are not going to be successful. Only Jesus can do this at a second coming. But God is calling us to fight and advance with him in spreading the kingdom of God, the good news of Christ, to those that do not know, so that they too might be saved and enter into the glory of God. Advancing the kingdom of God is a spiritual battle. God is calling us to take a stand with him and advance. We are called to storm the gates of hell where people are being held in chains of darkness. If you can just picture it, the enemy has a fortress, like a, 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 a great big high walls around people that he's trying to keep in, in bondage. He's desiring to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take the life out of these people. And they're caught behind his, his lines. And he's built a fortress around them. But there's gateways into that fortress. And we face spiritual struggles um, against those gates. 
And uh, we are called, by, as God's soldiers, to storm those gates, to work with God to see the people that are bound inside those fortresses liberated. Case in point, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6, Paul writes, For though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are powerful by God for the tearing down of strongholds. We tear down arguments and every obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to be, make, to, to be made obedient to Christ. In Ephesians 6.12, we're told, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of he evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus told Peter, remember when Peter, um, he, Jesus said that he would be Little Rock, Simon, he's now called Peter, Little Rock, and he told him, and on this rock, pointing to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the church is an armed force, going out, setting captives free, people that are bound in darkness, set free by the light of Jesus Christ. Gates are the entry points into the strongholds and the fortresses. They are the points where ancient warfare um, would focus its energy. Uh, like, you'd always have battles at the gates. If you gained access to the gates, you see you could storm the fortress. This is the weak point of the wall around those that are being held captive. If you gain access to the gates, you could storm the fortress and liberate the captives that were imprisoned within. So God's armor is given to us not merely to stand and to defend our own little shelters, you know. We don't just stand guard over our church and just sort of rest there, okay. No, the church is to be moving forward into the community, storming the gates of hell. When we storm the gates, it's not going to be easy. We're going to come up against resistance because the enemy has fortified those gates. And sometimes the fighting gets fierce. And Peter says that we should stand strong and resist the kingdom of Satan, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to protect us when we do so. Verse 9, Peter says, Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So notice that when we resist him, we resist the enemy collectively as a family. We will all face resistance from our foe. There's no one here that, that won't see this. We will not escape sufferings of different kinds. But God promises he will give strength to us to stand firm with having done everything to stand. It will not be easy, but the Lord promises he will be with us. He's not going to leave us alone, my friends. You are not alone in your struggle. If the enemy is coming against you, know that our brothers and sisters all over the place, all over the world actually, are enduring the same kind of resistance against the charge of the Light Brigade. But the, there is some very good news for the church, you see. Even though the darkness comes at us like a flood, the church will prevail against the enemy attacks. This is a promise. So warriors in the Lord, be strong in the Lord and absorb the thought arrows, his lies, which are fired at you with the shield of your faith. Hold it out. Hold it high. God has given this to you to fight and to triumph. If you're facing resistance and serving God, let the promises of Scripture be what you cling to. May you be strengthened to fight against your foe with the Word of God engraved on the tablets of your heart. And may you wield like a powerful sword under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Word of the living God. In Isaiah 54, 17, God made a universal promise to His children, and it applies to every true believer in the Lord today. 
he prophetically proclaims to all believers, saying, No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. And to this end, leaders, um, people that are in the church, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, don't take your eyes off Jesus. Leaders, don't take your eyes off Jesus. Lead in the direction of the charge. Stand the ground. When the, when the enemy is fighting against us, you need to take your leadership position and fight. Fight on your knees. Fight in prayer. Fight with the Word of God. Don't let the enemy um, off the hook because the Bible says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Exemplify the attitude of Christ as you humbly serve one another. Be thankful that you've been saved by God's mercy and that he's counted you worthy to suffer for his sake. Peter gives the saints a promise that after they have endured suffering and have prevailed against their enemy, God will make everything right in the world again. And Peter writes this promise in verse 10 and 11 saying, And the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So the apostle tells us that the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ, after a little while, he's going to make us strong, firm, and steadfast. You see, this is the outcome of of spiritual warfare. But the question is, what is this eternal glory that God has called us to? What is it comprised of? Paul says in Philippians 3:14, "If I press on, or sorry, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus." Peter says, "This eternal glory is strong, firm, and steadfast. It is the glory of perfected humanity when God has scooped off all the slag from the surface of our lives and now we're poured out of the crucible into the mold that God has prepared, perfected in character once we have crossed our finish line, pure as the purest gold. It is the glory of complete victory when we are welcomed into eternal life. It is the glory of being honored by our King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who will say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my glory. It is the glory of reflecting the glory of the Lord when we're given new bodies that will never grow old, never get tired, never experience pain, and never fade away. The old order of things will be passed away. All things will be made new. That is the glory of God that's going to reflect from us. But most importantly all, of all, um, this eternal glory is the glory of the immediate and constant presence of God. It is the glory of the enjoyment of God Himself which we will see and we will enjoy forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So be encouraged. If you've had trials and tribulations, the rest of the world has had them as well. The rest of the church has had them. But don't be afraid. In the end, God's going to work it all out. He's going to make everything new. To this, Peter adds his final comments. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chooses together, uh, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another 
with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. Well, you see, we have an enemy who is strong, but our God is greater. No weapon formed against you, my friends, will prosper. Turn your eyes towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on your armor and fight. Storm the gates of hell like uh, you understand what you're doing because in behind those gates are people. People that God loves and He has called you into His brigade to take the territory of the enemy by force. And those gates will fall. And those people will be liberated. And the church will be built to the glory of God. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone to fight the battles that we see alone. God, you know our foe is strong, but you are greater. Father, so we rest beneath the shadow of your wing and we call upon you to strengthen our limbs. God, strengthen us for battle. Help us to put on your spiritual armor that you've given to us, God, for this very purpose. Lord, we pray that as we storm the gates of hell, Father, that we would see them fall with a mighty crash and that captives that are behind those walls, God, would be set free, that people would come to know you as the living God and that they would be saved, delivered, and healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the privilege, the honor that you have given us to walk with you, to, to, to fight along with you, Father, in this wonderful um, kingdom of yours. God, a kingdom that will never end. God, I pray for those that are discouraged, that have been beat, that maybe have dropped their shield or need to, need to be reminded that they are uh, promised victory in Jesus' name if they pick up their weapons and they fight in accordance with your instructions. God, I just pray for those that are needing to be healed and refreshed, that they would call on you, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would refresh them and renew their, their, their minds, O oh God, and uh, that they would, see, um, they would see fortresses fall for you in Jesus' name. 